How you guys doing? Can you hear me okay? Good. I'm just using my laptop uh, microphone and speakers tonight. So hopefully that'll go well. For some reason, uh, yeah. Uh, good. All right. So I was worried nobody would get my uh, um, announcement about tonight. So clearly we did. 16, 17 people entered the waiting room, view the waiting room. Yes, admit all. Wow. <laughs> now we're talking. Admit all. Admit. Admit, admit. Nice. All right. So this is probably all of us. Now let's look at that tile view. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Oh, whoop, admit Gabe. I'm going to give folks just a while to sort of straggle in before I get started. I won't keep you long. Just a quick uh, intro to the course, and then I'll let you go. Um, all right. 34. I'm trying to think. We got, I think we have something like 59 people in our class, though, don't we? We got quite a few folks. Let me zoom over here for a second and check that. We've got a lot of folks. Yeah. Well, it's okay. We'll go with what we got. All righty. Let me, uh, hmm, how am I going to do this? Oh, Carson. I need to... Uh, get a shot of the uh, attendance list here before I get started. So let me just do that real quick. Gavin, from Gavin to, whoops. Marcus to the end of the list. Okay, 35 combatants. <laughs> All right, good. Very good. Thanks for coming, folks. I appreciate it. Um, what do I want to talk about? Let me share my screen with you so I can give you the, the uh, gist of what's going on here. Share me desktop. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to move you guys over here on this side of my world. There we go. Shift that out. Yeah, that's probably okay right there. Okay, let's get to it. We are section three, right? Whoops, that's not us. Back one. There we go. Okay, we are section three, cinematography one. Okay, so this course is going to be. Uh, it's, it's a derivative of my face-to-face -face course, okay? Uh, and what I did in the interest of time um, is I pared down everything from my previous Cinematography One class and I just pruned it up and I took the, I think the most salient core concepts and applied them to this class to make it a little easier uh, to adapt to an online environment and then uh, modified some assignments and uh, tried to make it so that you guys don't have to go to the campus if you don't want to. Is anybody here go to the campus? I don't have my uh, 
Is that a no? <laughs> I don't blame you if you don't. Um, I don't want to go. I didn't want to go last semester either. That's why I bowed out of the fall semester. Um, but uh, so let me move forward here and talk about the basic build. So here's your homepage. Okay. It's probably pretty much similar to what you see in other, uh, in your other classes. Okay. Just look for the shot of the ingenue. Uh, zoom lens looking down the barrel. That's uh, that's our little uh, course icon that I've uh, uh, found for you folks. And we're going to study uh, the preliminaries, the basic uh, core concepts in cinematography. Um, do I have any folks in class who are thinking that this might be their actual career path? Who's that? Catherine Johnson. Where are you? Oh, okay. You don't have your picture up, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me turn my volume up because you're I'm not coming through too clear. Okay. Um, okay, that's great. Um, then you're definitely uh, you're definitely here in the right place. Um, what are you other folks doing? Directors, writer, who's directing? Who's a director? So so <laughs> I am. I'm planning to get in there. Okay. How about a writer? Any also writer? that too. Okay. Writers, uh, you know, I'm a writer now myself. So um, I've made that odd transition. I don't know. Well, I know how it happened. I was really pretty surprised that it did. So uh, I'm now of the writer persuasion myself, uh, more so than a cinematographer or a chief lighting technician anymore. That's what I used to do in my other life. Um, but I still think, you know, even from a writer's standpoint, uh, given that I've become one and that you are an emerging one, um, I still, I, I think that it's important if you're gonna craft a document that somebody else is going to then take and break down and try to assemble visually with symbols and 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 visuals. Um, it kind of helps to know what some of the uh, the barriers might be. Um, so I think I, I think even a writer could benefit from this class in the broadest sense. Um, you don't want to write a movie where you know that there's very little technology that can accomplish the goals that you've set out to tell in your story. I can give you a really good example. Well, maybe not, you guys are pretty young, but Spider-Man, okay? The first one, uh, who was it? Tobey Maguire in the first three? I don't. I worked on one of them and I don't even know. Uh, yeah, the first Spider-Man, okay? The first Spider-Man was, was in the trades. And when I say the trades, I mean, like the Hollywood Reporter or uh, Vanity Fair, they um, they might do articles or they might just list in their upcoming production sections movies that are you know in pre-production or in in development. A lot of times in the Hollywood Reporter, they've got a whole section on Thursday where you can see all the movies that are in production that are going to go into production in the next quarter, let's say, and they give you you know names and addresses and phone numbers so you can sort of go out there and hunt for work. Um, Spider-Man was in the trades back in, I wanna make sure I got this right, but I'm pretty sure it was like 1998, uh, maybe further back than that. Um, and so they wrote this great script, you know, and Spider-Man's swinging around downtown New York City and he's doing all this stuff and he's, you know, walking up the side of the building and everything like that. And, you know, the producers, you know, who were trying to get that project together, they just kept thinking, you know, man, I don't know, you know, if we can make this movie and make it convincing for the audience, because we need to do a lot of digital work, we need to create a lot of CGI and, and the, the workflows, the cinematic workflows just aren't up to that challenge yet. And so, you know, the person who wrote that script had a great idea and a great vision for what the movie could be but they just they wrote themselves out of a job because uh the industry wasn't ready the, the pipelines the digital 
infrastructure wasn't there uh, for them to make that movie the way that it needed to be made at that time. So uh, they waited like another 10 years before, you know, the first Spider-Man came out for real. Uh, eventually when we got, you know, the 2K systems up and running in the pipelines of digital post-production and, and uh, you know, we could, uh, we could create the images that we needed to create and have them look of the quality to meet the expectations of the industry. Uh, so, you know, even a writer, it's going to be handy for a writer to know what, you know, what we're doing now, what we're capable of now and what our process is in real time when we're creating this sort of uh, this, this film, right? And when you write your scripts, uh, you know, you have that background and perspective. So, you know, uh, editors are gonna profit from taking this class, obviously, because as cinematographers, we're generating the content that the editor is gonna work with. So uh, I frequently uh, talk to editors when I'm shooting uh, to make sure I'm getting the right pieces that they're gonna want you know, that they, that they already see going together in a certain way, especially like on commercials and stuff. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the shot design and stuff on things like commercials are thought out well in advance of shooting. And, and all we have to do is walk in and execute. So um, editors, uh, you know, post-production people, you know, now post-production knows, you know, nearly as much about cinematography as we who work in the field uh, because a lot of times they're creating worlds and environments from scratch. And, and uh, a case in point, um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds about depth of field because we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, but there's a selective focus quality to photography that you can control. You can control the degree to which, let's say, you take a medium close up of your character and the background can be in sharp focus sort of in focus or totally blown out of focus, right? Now, you know, what aspects of the cinematography are related to controlling that aspect of the image? Well, it's your, your aperture, your depth of field and your exposure. And when we create uh, elements for CG um, or we shoot plates for CG, we also have to provide a Bible to the special effects people in post-production and we have to tell them what lenses we use to create that clip, uh, what exposures we used, what our uh, settings were on the camera, frame rates, uh, shutter angle, uh, apertures, okay, uh, what ISOs we were at, because all of those factors are now variables in some of the uh, attribute uh, creation tools in post-production. And so if they want to throw a background out of focus on a movie like Wally, -E, where it's completely animated, they still have a cinematographer. In fact, it was Roger Deakins who was a cinematographer on Wally, -E, a uh, cinematography consultant for an animated movie. Why? Because the animators and the effects people who were creating the images wanted to give those images cinematic feel, right? So if they want to throw something out of focus, in the background and give it a shallow depth of focus look like you get in a photographed feature, uh, they need to talk to somebody about that. What's involved? What kind of lenses do you use to get that, that effect? What are your exposures? You know, and, and they use that same information to create some of the CG that's going on. So, uh, you know, cinematography inherently, the, the, the technical side of it in, in some way, shape or form, it's gonna find its way into pretty much all the disciplines on set. Makeup people need to know what a cinematographer is doing. Cinematographer needs to know what the makeup people are doing. Uh, you know, I've shot guys, I shot The Rock one time for a commercial. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to the makeup people, asking them for uh, baby oil uh, for Dwayne so that I could get all, you know, my lighting looked okay and everything, you know, but I said, you know, I still, this, this is still Dwayne. It's not the rock yet. There's what, you know, and they said, Oh, and then I walked up to him and I, I asked him, I said, do you mind if we, you know, if we oil you up, I know you used to do that when you wrestled. He goes, no, no problem. What are you going to use? I said, just baby oil. He goes, yeah, no problem. So the, the makeup people came in and oiled them down. All of a sudden the lighting, all the highlights and everything in the lighting came alive because of something that the makeup people provided. Right. And 
So there's a good example of where two departments you think are never really going to work that closely together. And yet uh, I work with makeup people all the time. So I got a kind of a hot highlight on my forehead here. My key light is like right there, right over the, the last, my laptop camera, which is like the worst camera in the world. But my key lights right here. Okay. And with this kind of poor exposure control I have in this laptop camera, it's blowing that highlight out. All right. I was going to shoot my image with my uh, GH5, but my batteries were dead. They didn't charge properly in the charger. So I'm, you know, I'm using my backup system, which is the onboard camera. But if this was a problem on set, I might ask the makeup people, come over and give me a dust up, I call it. And they'll come in and they'll, you know, hit the actor with the base powder puff and just take that. And you'll just see it on the monitor. You'll just see the more makeup they apply to that highlight, it just disappears like magic, right? And I've controlled, without having to move my lights or anything else, I've controlled the degree of exposure or latitude in that highlight by applying makeup. So everybody, you know, at some point or another is going to work uh, in close proximity to the cinematographer. So you really are a segue to all the departments on set, right? Um, you're the one individual, I think, on the crew that um, truly walks a fine line between management that resides above the production line and everybody below the production line. That means labor, right? So everybody in the IOTC, you know, all the crafts are below the line uh, designations. So the cinematographer is the only one who walks that fence uh, and is the liaison truly between above and below the line. So I think everyone can benefit from this class and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hopefully it won't become a source of anxiety or, you know, belabored uh, extra work. Um, I really do hope that it's uh, an experience that you can benefit from. Um, if you go to my little medallions on the home page, I, I list announcements first because I want you guys to get in the habit of checking the announcements on a regular basis. This class, since this is our first meeting now, I've only got a couple of uh, announcements out, but for the other two classes now that I've already just launched as of yesterday, uh, I got a full page of announcements already for those classes. Uh, just because this situation right now is is really fluid, okay? I, I only came on board eight days ago, okay? I was not on the UCF payroll, not on faculty at all. I was a free agent out there, you know. I, in fact, I, I had resumes out at three different universities. UCF responded first with a, with a promise of a contract. All I got was a letter of intent to start work on Monday of this week, right? Or last week, sorry. Wait, what day is it? It's Tuesday, last week, right? So, uh, and I have four classes. So uh, the good news is we're up and running. The not so good news is, but I'm not sure that it's bad news, is that uh, I'm building the courses I go along. So I'm going to be opening up modules as we go along and you know releasing that information to you nothing that's going to catch you by surprise if you want to know what's going on with the course it's very simple you can go to um let's see go to the modules page okay which you can do from the home page if you click this medallion down here the explore and go to the modules page i have the course syllabus and the course outline posted for you guys to read, okay? Uh, that way I'm not generating any paper. I don't really like to go through the syllabus because it's really boring and boilerplate and you've probably heard it a hundred times already. Uh, and there's only a few specific items in the syllabus that are specific to this class. So you can go ahead and read the syllabus, check it out, you know, make sure that you're familiar with everything. I mean, the, you know, you're gonna see some different information here. The required text for this class is specific and so there's some information there about it. i'm going to tell you about that in a minute anyway um you know the course objectives are here those are unique to this syllabus um but you know things like the uh the um the uh, materials fee you, you know that already right um you know so i don't really want to spend a lot of time going through this there's there's no real reason to do that it's the same thing you've heard already on and on an infinitum. 
I do have uh, all of the pertinent course dates from the UCF schedule at the end of it though, uh, and your holidays listed and uh, spring break. So we got kind of boned this semester. Spring break is like, it's April 11th and your last class day is April 26th. So <clears throat> they just barely got spring break scheduled for you guys. And uh, it's all the way at the end of the semester. So that's kind of a bummer, but it is what it is. Now, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Day is next week on Monday. That's not gonna affect you guys because we meet on Tuesday. <laughs> um, but here's the other thing, everything is gonna be online. So, and as far as these Zoom meetings go, for instance, uh, these are not mandatory. I'm not going to make these mandatory for you. Uh, I photographed the participants list so I can you know, give you all attendance credit for this Zoom. If you can't make the live go to session, check the recording. OK, so I'm going to be recording all of these sessions. In fact, I'm rolling right now. Uh, so you can go back. I'll take this Zoom meeting and I'm going to just put it on the web courses LMS. I'm going to load it in and, and give it a page name. And then you can go back and you can watch this lecture, you know, the next day, later that evening, uh, you know, whatever. Um, don't wait too long because the information will be relevant to what you're doing in the next day or so. So I would say, you know, make sure you watch it by, say, Friday. Um, and then it's technically an assignment. OK, so we can tally and track who is watching the lecture. So it's a text box response. The lectures are not part of the grade structure of the class, except that they relate to your participation or attendance grade. Um, but it's not like you can fail a Zoom assignment, right? You cannot do it. And then you, I guess, could get a zero for it. but you know, it wouldn't go into your test grade averages, it would just go in your attendance grade. Um, but there's a text response box for the assignment lecture. And just tell me something about the lecture. Uh, you know, I liked the part about depth of field, or uh, I see that we're going to study lenses next week, whatever, I don't care. Just so that I know that you watched the lecture. And then as soon as you enter that text and hit done or send or whatever it is that you guys see on your end, it's, I'm going to know that you saw the lecture. So if you don't come here, do the video lecture assignment and just write something in the text box. Okay. That's how you get credit for it. And that's how we're going to tabulate your attendance slash participation grade. Okay. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. Good. Good. Uh, let's go back to the LMS. So Okay. So here, the syllabus is in here. You can look at it. Now, if I tweak the syllabus or something, I think I've got the alerts set up. So you'll see that I've changed something and then you can go check it out or you can whatever, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, but uh, I, you know, that's why I put it in here and load it up so you guys can access it and you can look at it anytime you want. I've also got the, um, course outline loaded in as well. Okay. So this is my plan for, I think this goes all the way to week nine. Uh, uh, week eight. Okay. Week eight, which is a midterm exam, 30 questions, multiple choice. Okay. Uh, easy. You know, I don't want to break your back with this stuff. I, you know, 30 questions divided by eight weeks is what, you know, five, four, you know, four, less than four questions per section three and a half questions per section. So it's just enough to, you know, to make sure that, you know, uh, the topics weren't lost on you in some way. All right. So you can look through the outline and see what we're going to do every week. So this week is intro, right? You have a financial aid assignment. Okay. And it's in uh, web courses. I'll show you where it is in a second. Uh, the, there's a question. It's one question and uh, you can probably do it in five minutes. Okay. Uh, how many of you know who cinematographer Roger Deakins is? I just talked about him. Okay, so if you don't, that's good too, because you'll get to do a little quick research. So Google Roger Deakins, check out who this person is, okay? 
very prolific cinematographer in Hollywood. It's probably shot a movie or two that you've seen and enjoyed, okay? If not more than a couple. I want you to find out how many times Roger Deakins has been nominated for Academy Award and then enter that answer in the text box for the financial aid assignment. So I'm looking for a number, okay? And when you find that number, enter it in the text box. And newsflash, you can be completely and utterly wrong, right? The minute you enter a number and hit send in that assignment text box for financial aid, they're gonna know that you're participating in class and then they're gonna generate your FAFSA grants or loans or whatever it is that you're waiting for in your financial aid. So it's really just to trigger your financial aid. All right. But I think you might find it interesting to read a little bit about Roger Deakins and find out how many times this person's been nominated, because I, I think you'll be surprised. Okay. So financial aid assignment week two or section two is next week. And that's the week that, um, my Monday class doesn't meet, but we meet in the evening. And we're gonna talk about uh, cinematography style. And I'm gonna introduce you to, uh, I think it's four. I got four guys pulled to talk to you about. Um, and I wanna show you their, their reels and talk about their style a little bit and start giving you a sense of what, you know, the expectation is for a cinematographer, okay? Uh, I've selected Roger Deakins. Um, I've selected Emmanuel Lubetsky, uh, Christopher Doyle, and Seamus McGarvey. And it's a pretty good cross-section of folks as well. Um, and each of these guys, if I'm not mistaken, has won either an Academy Award or an ASC Award, or maybe both. Um, or has been recognized in some way, uh, McGarvey for his long uh, camera, camera shots without edits, uh, Doyle for his insane use of color and his uh, uh, experience working um, in the Hong Kong cinema. Emmanuel Lubetsky shot Gravity and The Revenant and Birdman and uh, Itu Mama Tambien and... Um, Gosh, I mean, he shot a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, he's here. And then, of course, Roger Deakins. So, and then we're going to talk about uh, chapter two in the textbook. Now, interesting. The textbook is, let me go to my modules page here. The textbook is uh, Introduction to Cinematography by uh, Tanya Hozier. I have a copy of it, I think, right here. Yeah. It's a nice book. This is it. Okay. Um, it's not the same textbook that I used to use. I used to use uh, Cinematography Theory and Practice, which looks like this. But this book is not as effective a primer as the introduction by Hozier. So I've switched the textbook for this course now. Uh, and because I only started on last Monday, uh, obviously there was no time to alert the bookstore of that contingency. So uh, you'll have to procure it uh, from other sources. But the good news is they've got it for rent at Amazon. And if you go to their website, you'll see that they have the, um, the textbook. Here it is. You can look inside at the table of contents. I would say, you know, I mean, you probably don't want to buy it for, you know, I think the cheapest price right now, yeah, $44, $49. Uh, unless, you know, if you, you know, you can write this stuff off of your taxes. So, it's you know part of your professional library if you elect to buy the text. If you're gonna be in any of the technical disciplines when you get out of college, lighting, grip, camera, okay, you probably wanna buy the, the book, right? Um, if you're just taking cinematography this semester cause you have to, <laughs> cause it's a core class, rent it, okay? 
uh, and if you play with their little, uh, you see this little calendar widget down here? If you tell them when you're gonna be done, see how I've selected uh, April 23rd, which I, th I think is the last Friday before study day. Uh, the rental's $21.29. So you can have it starting now until April 23rd, if I'm not mistaken for 21.29. I think that's a pretty good deal. I think that's cheaper than what you'd see at the, the bookstore. Um, and I have looked high and low uh, for a PDF copy that I could pull down from the internet and distribute to you guys. And I have yet, I, I have a version that is loaded into my laptop that I, without a great deal of labor intensive copying and pasting and editing, I can't really uh, reassemble the book uh, in a usable fashion for the class. So, uh, you'll have to acquire the textbook on your own. Um, you know, this is not unusual, right? You're getting textbooks for your other classes. The rental's pretty cheap though, so I think that's good news. Um, the, the, the other piece of good news that I do have for you though, is that uh, as far as any of the other materials that I reference in the class, if you go to the modules page uh, of the course and click on the tab supplemental textbook and PDF resources. Um, I'm giving you uh, several texts already. I'm giving you the old textbook, which I have uh, a couple, of, I think I got one or two chapters of reading assigned out of that book. Uh, I give you the camera assistance manual by Dave Elkins. Uh, this is actually a public domain text that uh, he basically donated to the public domain, which I think is a, a hell of a thing. In other words, you can download Dave Elkins' book all day long on the internet um, and he's okay with it uh, because he just wants to make sure that uh, anybody who's gonna work in the industry as a camera assistant has the right and vetted information. And I, I, think, that, I think that's very admirable, uh, which is why I had my choice between two camera assistants books to offer you uh, and because his is public domain, uh, I chose Dave's book because I think that that's really great that he's so committed to education that he's not worried about profiting off of this. He just wants you to have the right info, uh, which I think is really cool. Uh, I'm giving you a copy of the seventh edition of the ASC manual. Uh, that's the sacred black book, uh, which in my time in the service, this was the ASC manual to have. There were other manuals out there. They come out every couple of years or so. Um, when I got into the business, uh, I think 86, the ASC manual was red and it was half as thick as this one is, as you can see here, it's about half as thick. Um, this has all of the film-based um, uh, knowledge and information that a, an ASC cinematographer is responsible for knowing. Um, it's got some really neat like depth of field tables in here that you might find useful. Talks about lenses in here, the difference between cinema lenses, uh, spherical and anamorphic lenses. It's got all kinds of information in here. That, and I know I'm speaking a lot of psycho babble to you right now, uh, but you'll understand as we move along through the semester uh, what those terms mean, okay? Uh, it's all in here. I mean, this is a really good, this used to be the thing, I mean, before the, <laughs> before the internet and we could carry a, a, a tablet around or a, a smartphone and access info, you had to have this in your back pocket if you were a, a, a director of photography. Uh, so I gave you a copy of that. You can take a look at it. I still think it's beneficial to have these things, these, these print materials. Uh, you can't always access the internet, okay? If you're going to be in the film business, you're going to find yourself in some of the weirdest remote places sometimes where there's no phone service and no internet. Okay. And that's sometimes when it's nice to have something like this in your back pocket or in your, in your gear bag on the truck, and you can look something up if you don't have access to Google. Um, so I still think it's nice to have, you now have it as a PDF copy and you can keep it in whatever your favorite device is and access the information anytime you need it. I'm also giving you a copy of motion picture and video lighting by the same guy that wrote the textbook we used to use for class, Blaine Brown. So you'll have some lighting principles at, the, at your fingertips. 
you'll have camera data and tables and information at your fingertips, a nice camera assistance manual at your disposal and a, two textbooks uh, of cinematography that you can rely on. And that's a good start to a professional library. Um, if you guys want it, um, I use uh, not this semester, this semester is an online course that was already built. So I'm just sort of babysitting. But when I teach face to face introduction to production, I use this textbook. And if you guys want it, I can make it available to you as well. Uh, this is, I think, the best textbook on uh, the broad production picture uh, that you can that you could uh, possibly uh, procure. And it's got a lot of um, forms and things in here that you can pull out and and copy and use as templates for uh, your own production paperwork. If you're, uh, do I have any production managers, uh, aspiring production managers or assistant directors in here? No, really? What do you guys all want to do? Are you not sure yet? It's okay to not, to not know. Uh, I knew, you know, but I'm a weirdo. So uh, I got in the film industry when I was 20 years old. So, and I got in the camera department because I was convinced that that was where I wanted to be. And I went full circle through three different departments and wound up back up in the camera department. So I took a little guided tour of a set career. It started in camera and ended in camera. So it's all right. If you don't know right now, it's not a big deal. Uh, that's really what these classes are all about. It's discovering what you know, what you gravitate towards, what inspires you and, and what you're good at. And, you know, gives you some idea what you can start hunting down when you go out looking for a job when you graduate. Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to the outline. And we can keep talking about that for a minute. Uh, course outline. So Week three, I'm going to introduce you to the camera department as a departmental whole, right? So there's several individuals who work in the camera department. We'll talk about each person's job, where they are in a hierarchy, if you will, uh, within the department, what their responsibilities are, what they're trying to accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis on set. Uh, week four, we'll talk about media, mostly about storage media and I'll talk to you a little bit about um, archiving your material, storing it after you've dealt with it, after you've shot it and edited with it and so forth. It used to be a much broader chapter covering several aspects of digital media management. And I, I think I put so many people to sleep <laughs> with all of that lecturing about uh, media management that I cut it out of the class um, and just decided, okay, what do you really need to know from that, uh, from that particular lecture? And what I would want to know if I was in your position right now is um, if I have a, I don't know, a Panasonic GH4 and I have a data card and I want to shoot 4K video with the GH4 on this data card that somebody gave me from the production office. And it turns out that it's a, you know, 32 gigabyte uh, SDHC data card. And they said, here, here's the data card. You would know right off the bat after, after week three to hand that data card right back to the camera assistant or the production assistant and say, I can't shoot on this card. It won't work with this camera, okay? And then you'll know why, and then you'll know what card you need to have, and then you'll be able to calculate how much record time is on different kinds of data cards. I, and I think that's valuable information. I think that's what you would really wanna know, what you would need to know. Uh, and the rest of it is like graduate level study, which I will no longer bore you with. Um, so that's all we're gonna do in week three, uh, four rather, I'm sorry. Week five, I wanna to talk to you about some of the different kinds of cameras that are out there. And so I'm gonna start talking to the broad audience about, uh, for instance, if, you're, if you, if you wanna make documentaries after you graduate, if that's what your career focus is, you might not want or need the same kind of camera that I would use if I was gonna go shoot a feature film. Or 
let's say you want to be a YouTuber when you graduate. You want to start your own website and you want to do YouTube videos and you want to build a whole brand and stuff and shoot, just shoot hey there videos or how to videos and put them up on your YouTube account. You probably don't need the same camera as either one of me or the documentary person, either one of us, you need a different camera altogether, uh, which is smaller, easier to use, less expensive and so forth. So I want to talk to you about a couple of different types of cameras. And then I, I want to show you some stuff and, and just so that you, you get an opportunity to see it at least once before you're thrown out into the world. Uh, week six, so week five, we'll talk about cameras. Week six, we'll talk about the lenses that go on the cameras uh, and concepts related to the lenses, okay? So it's not just last week I showed you a camera and this week I'm showing you a lens. I wanna to talk to you about why this lens and not this lens. What's the difference? Well, there's a lot to, of difference. So we'll, we'll talk about that and what that's good for, what you, what you need to know what the salient points are and then we'll move on from there and then week seven i want to talk to you about filtration and the advantages of using filters in camera uh, to do things either control exposure create visual effects or correct color inconsistencies or inaccuracies in the color science um, or to create uh, aesthetic effects um, and the reason why we still use what we, we call them drop-ins, in, in other words, filters that we use in front of the camera lens instead of doing that digitally with digital tools in Final Cut or Premiere Pro, for instance, is there are certain filtration effects that just don't work well digitally. They really have to be done analog and in camera. So I wanna to talk to you about those few options that are out there that still really should be handled in camera. And that'll take us up to our midterm. So hopefully that's not too bad, not too taxing. The midterm will be pretty easy. Um, after the midterm, we have a couple of weeks, I guess, and then you guys go to spring break and then a week after that, and then we're in study time and, and then we're out of time. So I don't know, this semester might go quick. I don't know, we'll see, but um, that's uh, at least up to week eight, that's the plan. Um, but like I said, check the announcements on a regular basis in case I change something on the schedule or on the syllabus and you'll get the info right away. Okay. Because, uh, you know, it's funny that, <laughs> for instance, in my, in my Monday's class, I showed folks announcements. I told them to watch out for announcements. I gave them certain pieces of information in my lecture. And then like immediately after the lecture, I was getting questioned. My mailbox was exploding with questions that I covered in the lecture. So know, know that as soon as I know what I'm doing, if I need to expedite change, you know, I'm gonna send out an announcement and let you know. And I've also got the little box ticked in web courses in the you know, in the control parts that you guys don't get to see that should be alerting you when I make a change to the to the class. Okay, and if that gets too annoying, and that becomes a, a real distraction, let me know, and I'll turn that function off. Okay. Because I know I hate getting flooded in my inbox with a bunch of crap. In fact, I got flooded with my own junk today, and got mad at myself because all the changes I made to my writing class a little while ago flooded my mailbox. And I said, oh my God, I had 27 emails. And I looked in, it was all me. It was all crap that I did. So uh, if that starts getting annoying, let me know and I'll shut it off. Um, okay, uh, so I covered the, let me go right to the modules page now. So you can access this page through the home page. Like I said, go down to the little buttons at the bottom and click the explore button. These two buttons here, this one leads to the Zoom page. Uh, in case you need to, you know, access the, you know, the registration information or whatever. This one goes to the UCF technical support in case you have internet problems or laptop problems or, you know, whatever other problems they deal with over there at IT. Uh, you can access that there. Um, so let me show you the modules page just looks like this. I know it's just sort of 
really uninteresting line items. But as I publish, they'll turn green. As I'm finished making sure that they're complete with all the information, I'll go ahead and publish them. So you can see that I'm published up to uh, the video lecture for this week. Um, after I'm done with you guys tonight, I will download this video lecture, transcode it, and I will embed it into this page right here. So you can go back and watch it again if you want to see my shining face or uh, you can let your colleagues know if they didn't have a chance to show up here uh, where they can access this lecture and you can watch it. You know, you can use it as a study tool as well. Tonight I'm kind of, you know, winging it and, and working off the cuff. Uh, but when I start doing my full blown keynotes, I'm gonna show you what one of them looks like in a minute. Uh, you can go back and watch this lecture again if you're studying for a test, let's say, uh, you know, and access the information. I might, throw some small quizzes into the mix, but I'm not sure. I think that um, the assignments and the midterm and the final might be enough as far as grading goes. Um, if I did, it would be a small, you know, like five question quiz or something stupid like that. Um, and if I do that, you'll see an announcement for it. Um, and so if you needed to study for something like that, you could watch this, uh, you could watch the keynote lecture again. So, <clears throat> okay, in the getting started items that I've got for you. So this is just a little blurb about, you know, it's propaganda really. What you can do to be successful at UCF, <clears throat> poop. Financial aid assignment is explained here. I told you what it is already. If you need to hear that information again, you can go to this tab. Your syllabus is here for you to look at. Course outline is here. General discussion board, I think this will be fun. Uh, Already the kids are using it in two of my other classes. And I never used to put these in my classes until about a year and a half ago. Um, I put one in a class and everybody liked it. They seemed to like the idea of having a forum that was sort of outside of the topical discussions that we have every week and outside of any discussion post that we would do as an assignment and just an opportunity, especially now, since you're all working remotely. If you wanted to, you know, have a conversation in the general discussion room about the movie you saw last weekend, or you're thinking about buying a camera and you're not sure what you should do. Does anybody have any suggestions or, you know, I don't know, whatever you want to talk about. It's your forum. I'm not going to curate it. I'm not going to monitor it. Um, I'm going to have you you know, function under your own recognizance, right? So that means don't be rude, don't swear, don't insult anybody and don't do anything rude on camera and everything is cool. Um, and then you guys can talk about whatever you want. It's an open discussion board. And, you know, especially working remotely like this, I think it's a handy thing to have, um, you know, and if not, you don't have to use it. It's not an assignment. You don't have to do it. It's just there if you want it. Uh, I told you about the library, so I may add a book or two to this list as we go along. And if I do, I'll let you know that it's there. Like I'll probably throw the, the, uh, Eve Honthener production book in here for you. Uh, and then if I ever find a PDF copy of the text, I'll throw that in here as well. But, uh, I get going on the rental, uh, in the meantime, so that you can do your, your course reading, uh, appropriately. And then what have I got here? So I've got, uh, you know, the basic introduction for tonight. If you guys want to see who you're dealing with, uh, go to my IMDB. I got the link down here if you want to see what I've done. I've been in the film business for over 30 years. Um, I've been teaching for, this is my 11th year. Um, there's obviously a little overlap because I'm not 64, I'm only 54. And you say, wait a minute, those numbers don't add up. That's right, they don't if you take them linearly. So there's a little overlap between when I left my career working on set and when I began teaching. And it kind of coincides with when I was shooting. Uh, when I was working as a chief lighting technician, as a gaffer in the field, lighting movies for a living, I didn't have time to teach. Uh, I didn't have time to do anything, really. I barely had time to sleep. Um, but then when I started shooting, obviously when you move up in the hierarchies, you get less work. 
And so I had more time available to me. And that's when I started, uh, I started my own production company. Um, and I did like, you know, one commercial a month, uh, which was fine. Cause that, you know, was enough income to sustain me, but it gave me a lot of time. So that's when I started uh, teaching. Um, and so this is my 11th year of, of teaching now. I've been a member of the IATSE. Anybody know what the IATSE is? International Alliance of Theatrical and Studio Employees. It's a division of the AFL-CIO. It's a labor union, right? Anybody have parents that were in labor unions? No? Uh, it's not as far as I know. Like. Okay, well, uh, in my day, so what am I talking about? 1987, 88, right? Um, Mid-80s, I think I worked on my first commercial in 86. Um, in that day, you know, getting into the film industry was <laughs> a little, not, not quite as dramatic as winning the lottery, but your chances of getting in the film industry were pretty, pretty thin, especially if you didn't live in a production city. So like if you were from Boise, <laughs> you weren't going to be in the film industry. You had to move to Los Angeles or New York, Chicago, maybe, uh, you know, Miami, maybe there was no Atlanta in those days, not like there is today. Um, there was no Austin, Texas. There was no Rodriguez and the Troublemaker Studios. And there was no Quentin Tarantino in Austin, Texas. And, you know, there was no Terminator Salvation in Albuquerque. And, you know, uh, it was very clandestine. It's still kind of clandestine, but in those days, it was really hard to figure out where the industry was, who was involved and how to become involved. Um, it's a lot easier now. So in those days, uh, especially if you wanted to make this a career, the, the best way to do it was to join a labor union because they had people that would, you know, organize work contracts uh, on behalf of groups, you know, making the movie, negotiate your salaries and your benefits uh you know negotiate whether or not you got health insurance and what that constituted um and then the labor unions were full of experienced people that became your mentors and would teach you the ropes and shepherd you along over your development and when they felt that you had learned enough to be able to go out and work in the field unsupervised on your own you became a full-fledged member of the union. You, you were a card-carrying member and you could go and work on any movie you wanted. If they knew you and they wanted to hire you, you were good to go as long as your card was in good standing and all your dues were paid. That was how you made movies. It's still how you make movies at the highest levels, um, but it's a lot easier now to work on a small independent feature and become involved with that whole deal uh, than it ever was in the old days. But I'm not teaching you how to go out and make little low budget, no budget movies where you're never going to earn any money and you can't do it for a living. I would like to teach you guys things that you need to know so you could go to Atlanta and start asking people for a job and not feel embarrassed that you didn't know what you were doing or that they would figure out that you were a novice. I want to give you information that you can trade for a paycheck. That's my goal. I'm not here to teach you how to do this as in your spare time. And so you still have to get a job waiting tables. That's not being in the film industry. Being in the film industry means you like cameras, then you work with cameras and you get paid to work with cameras. That's what I'm talking about. Right. And I would seek that for you guys because it's not as hard as you think. It's easier now, I think, to get involved in the industry than it was when I was a kid because I had no idea where the industry was or how to get involved. Um, so uh, let's attack the problem from that angle and say, hey, we're, we're here to learn things that are going to make you attractive to those people uh, hiring for positions on films in a place like Atlanta. And then if your ambitions aren't that high, that's OK, because Nothing that you're going to learn here is going to be useless information if you still want to be a documentarian or a YouTuber or 
uh, you might just shoot music videos, uh, you know, something like that. Or you get a corporate job working here in town. I didn't realize it, but my gosh, Florida Hospital has a huge media division in house and they shoot all kinds of stuff for the hospital and they've got a, a big hospital network. So they shoot patient interviews and they shoot in-house films about the facilities and they do documentaries about patients and patient care and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and they're making video movies and stuff over there and it's an in-town job. So um, even a job like that, you're, you'll, you'll benefit from the stuff in this course. So I don't think it'll be a waste of your time and hopefully you have fun doing it. Um, but if you want to know what my career looked like, go here to this link and you can see the kinds of movies that I worked on. Uh, I list a couple of them up here, Angels and Demons, Eagle Eye, Pirates of the Caribbean 2 and 3, Into the Blue, Dukes of Hazard, Monster, Bad Boys 2, Too Fast and Too Furious, Tears of the Sun, The Water Boy, Any Given Sunday, Armageddon. Uh, at current recollection, it's 76. Every once in a while, I'm sitting on the sofa watching football and go, hey, I just remembered a movie that I worked on. <laughs> I'll check my IMDb and see if it's on there or not. Uh, and I have remembered a couple of things that they didn't catch in my, uh, in my career and I had them put it up there. So right now it's currently at 76 feature films and, and counting um, and over 400 episodes of television. So I've done a little Hollywood stuff. Um, and I want to impart some of that to you. It doesn't do me any good to hold on to it uh, in my dusty old head, right? It serves the community better if I teach you guys a little bit about what I know. So that's why I'm here. Um, what else can I talk to you about? That's in the welcome module. The next one here, introduction is, uh, yeah. Oh, I use a lot of... Um, video resources in this class, uh, you know, little snippets on concepts here and there uh, that fit well, that dovetail into either my lectures or into the chapters you're reading about. And so I'll, I'll put a video up and, and have you look at it. And I use a lot of stuff from Cook Optics. Uh, they're a lens manufacturer out of uh, England. They've been in business for over a hundred years. They started off uh, known as Taylor Hobson. Uh, optics, and then they changed their name to Cook uh, early in, excuse me, early in the last century. And recently, within the last 10, eh, not 10 years, but maybe five years, uh, they've been, uh, they've, they've established a website, and they have these great Cook Optics TV videos. Uh, they do a lot of interviews with cinematographers, they have, uh, you know, they ask, DPs about, you know, the movies they've just got done shooting and, you know, they, they do nice little vignettes and stuff about all, all kinds of stuff. And I use a, a great deal of their material. I have asked them for permission to do so and they have graciously granted us uh, whatever accessibility and use we want for the class and they're happy to do it and they, they say hello and they're happy to invite you into the Cook family at your earliest convenience in the future. Um, check out their website. They make really nice lenses, some of the best lenses in the world. Um, I got a little blurb somewhere. Did I do, this is um, Bradford Young. He shot Arrival. Um, that was the movie that came out year before last about the aliens. Um, there's a couple of videos in here that hopefully will inspire you. I've got a little vignette about being a cinematographer. Uh, and then I've got a, a Cook Optics uh, video here about uh, what makes a cinematic image and they go out and they ask, <clears throat> I don't know, about 15 different DPs what they think a cinematic image is um, and what the difference is between a cinematic image and a run of the mill video image or a photograph, uh, because there's a distinct difference. I think there is, uh, most cinematographers think there is a difference. In other words, you can take a video camera and shoot your kid's birthday, right? That's not cinematography, okay? That's videography at best, right? And, and the simple reason is because 
there's no deliberate creative thrust happening there. You're simply trying to document an event and you're doing it um, not so much with attention to detail as you are hosing down an entire event in the room, in the kitchen or around the dining room table to get the blowing out of the candles and to get the balloons and the presents and the cake and all of that. And you're just kind of shooting everything and anything you can put in front of the camera that relates to that event on that day, right? Uh, and then maybe later you'll edit it somehow and reassemble it uh, in a crafty, creative way. But initially you're just kind of hosing it down, just shooting everything. We call it hosing it down. Uh, cinematographer approaches shooting a scene in very specific ways. They decide what shots they're going to need. A lot of stuff can be figured out ahead of time. So you guys go to the theater and you see a movie and it, it's an investment of your time of say an hour and a half to two hours. But that movie probably took, the average is about 42 days to make a feature film. Uh, and it can run as long as, hell, I was on Pirates of the Caribbean 2 and 3 for the better part of two years. Okay? So it all really kind of depends on what the movie is and who the production company is and how much money they got, right? And Disney's got pretty deep pockets. That's why, you know, we were able to milk it as long as we did. <laughs> um, but the average is about 42 days, okay? Uh, and then there was a pre-production process, a planning process, uh, a procurement of assets process, a, uh, a writing, script writing process, a casting process that happened before the shooting of the movie, before those principal 42 days that we call principal photography. Pre-production could be a week, could be six weeks, could be eight weeks, could be a year, okay? And then after those 42 principal photography days, there's a post-production period on a film. And that could be a week, a month, or a year, okay? Uh, depending on the movie, depending on what it is and the scope of the special effects that are required. Um, and then of course, the vendors and facilities that are involved. So a two hour movie that you go to see in the theater could be the culmination of as many as four years of intensive uh, work on the part of a lot of people. Okay, so a Pirates of the Caribbean movie, there was about 150, 200 of us on set at any particular time. Uh, and that was in principal photography. And then we had three units, I think. First unit, second unit, and the other guys, you know, additional photography unit, <clears throat> stunt unit, right? And Teamsters and office people and, you know, I mean, it gets insane. And so it's, you know, <clears throat> cinematography is one small part of that whole process, but I want you to start thinking about it as a process and not just a random thing. So a cinematographer has a plan and they've thought about it for a good long time. Six, say six to eight weeks is an average pre-production for a cinematographer, four weeks to six weeks. All right, and then 42 days, and then at least a week to two weeks in post-production to polish up the images, color correction and stuff before they conform it into the final movie and then print release copies and send those all over the country to the theaters, right? Um, and so there's a deliberate thought process. There's a creative process at work there. And that approach is what I'm talking about when I talk about cinematography, not talking about random pictures that we take without really thinking about it, okay? And although, Steven Soderbergh shoots movies on this, right? And they won an Academy Award for, what was it called? Bright Tangerine, uh, about four years ago. Shot on an Apple phone, right? They shot some BMW commercials on Apple phones when the seven first came out to prove that it could create images that looked cinematic. Doesn't make this a cinema camera. This makes it a cinema camera, a cinematographer, okay? So you can put this in my hand or you can put, I don't know, a cinema camera, DSLR, you know, a video camera in, in my hand. And my process, my approach, the way, I, the way I use that tool is cinematography, okay? And that's what we're doing. That's what we're talking about. 
okay? For every module, you get, you know, maybe a little blurb like this. It might just be a buffet, right? It might be your videos for the week. And if I've put it here, chances are I've already shown it to you in a lecture uh, keynote, okay? So I put them here so you can go back and readdress them if you want to study or just get a second look at something or, you know, if you're having trouble understanding something, you can watch a video on, on what it is as many times as you need to. Downloadable PDFs are here, something I want you to read. Or what I what I might do is uh, also put PDF versions of the of the decks up here as well, so you can look at a cell at a time uh, from the lecture video to get information out if you need to. And then your reading assignment will be listed in here as well. Okay, so every week, every module is going to basically be like that. Okay. So it'll pretty much look like this every week and then you just go in and access it right after after tonight i'll download your lecture and i'll load it in this box right under this blurb of text. And you'll be able to go in and watch it again, if you want to, or you know if in one of the coming weeks, you don't have an opportunity to come to the live lecture just go to the page for whatever section we're in and look at the video lecture and then you know like i said write something in the little text box and hit send and you'll get credit for watching the uh the lecture okay and that's basically it for the lms um every week i'm gonna have a keynote for you uh it'll start with a library card like this and i'll just go through you know whatever the information is so this week uh, I've got a shot. Uh, so one of my friends sent me uh, a, a link to uh, to this in the Hollywood. I think it was a Hollywood Reporter uh, about Tom Cruise shooting uh, Mission Impossible Seven. Uh, at the time of these photos, it was in Italy, <clears throat> and I used to I used to mount cameras on cars. That used to be one of my jobs, and so a lot of guys know that. And so he sent me this because he knew that I did a lot of this kind of work myself in the past. And I always love looking at another grips uh, work. I like to see, oh, I might not have rigged it that way, but it's interesting to see how they use the pipe here. Oh, I see they have a custom pipe that they painted the same color as the car and they've integrated it, either welded it or screwed it right to the car. That means that they owned this car. It wasn't a rental. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't cast like they would cast a dog or an actor. Uh, it was actually bought as an asset for the feature so that they cut it and weld to it and whatever they had to do, you know, and that's one way of accomplishing this kind of technique. I could mount cameras all over this car without one single screw hole if I had to. Okay, and it all depends on whether or not production can afford to buy the car and let you chop it up however you need to to, to get uh, to execute filming or whether they got to return it at the end of production and it better not have a scratch on it or they got to pay for the damages as well. Uh, and so depending on the budget and who negotiated the deal, the car, you might be able to drill into the car and you might not. So I thought, uh, and, and, and he thought it would be neat to send me a picture of, of uh, what they did on this little Renault, I think it is. Um, and I was always, I always seemed, at this point in my career, when I was doing this for a living, when I was mounting cameras to things, uh, it seemed like I, I was never on the right job where they had enough money to buy the car. So I could never screw or drill to the thing. I always had to figure out a non-destructive way of mounting a 75 pound film camera to the hood of some kind of car they were gonna go screaming through downtown with and not have the camera fall off you know, and be able to get the shot and make sure the frame was stable and the thing didn't shift uh, in transit or whatever. It seemed like I was always on the, on the movie that couldn't afford to just cut the car. <laughs> so anyway, that's just my anxiety talking. But anyway, it was a neat picture. So you'll get a title card, you get a library card and a title card. Um, on the library card, a little hint right here, in between the parentheses, that tells you how many cells are in the lecture. So uh, 15 to 25 cells is uh, under an hour. So an hour is usually 30 cells. Uh, 80 cells is like two to two and a half hours, about two and a half hours. So it tells you how much information is in a particular uh, keynote. <clears throat> For the first couple of keynotes, I'll have the important uh, dates from the spring calendar and then I'm I'll, I won't post, post that anymore uh, just to save space. 
I'll do some PSAs once in a while. This one's for the operational portal. You guys know what the operational portal is? Okay, this is really handy. Um, I, I don't think you'll need to, re to rent any gear from the UCF equipment room this semester. Uh, I think I've got it sort of figured out, sorted out to where you don't need anything but maybe your cell phone to shoot video with. Um, but if you wanted to, for instance, there are some cameras uh, that you're eligible to check out even now. Uh, and if you wanted to do so, uh, you could arrange for all of that through the portal. Um, so there's a link uh, if you needed to rent equipment, there's a link under equipment. Um, if you need to know about the facilities and who does what and, and where, uh, there's information there. They have training videos. Uh, if you rent a piece of gear and you're not entirely sure how to operate it, uh, they're going to they're going to give you a crash course when you rent the gear from the equipment room, but they might also have a tutorial on the portal and you can go watch, for instance, if you needed a, to brush up on how to operate uh, a sound recording device, for instance, you could look that up on the on the training modules. There's also announcements uh, about events and things that uh, you can attend. So like a couple times a year, they have the uh, production meet and greet. Have you guys gone to that yet? I don't think they've had the, the meet and greet for this fall or for this spring. They might not because of COVID, um, but that's usually when the entire uh, film department as students kind of get together and everybody can meet each other. Uh, the upperclassmen, the BFAs uh, who are making capstone films, a lot of times they're looking for eager students who want to work on their projects and help them get their films made. Uh, MFA students are doing the same thing. You know, they're making thesis films and they need crew. So they're looking for students who want practice, uh, you know, doing the different crew positions on their on their thesis films. Um, or if you just want to meet other, you know, students in the film program, the film program is pretty big. I think there's there's six or eight hundred of you guys uh, in the program right now. I don't know if you realize that or not. So you may not encounter everyone in the film program. There's probably people that you haven't even met, wouldn't even uh, recognize uh, that are in the program with you. Uh, so there's stuff like that, announcements like that. I'll put in the in the beginning of these keynotes. Uh, my bio is only in the first one. After that, it's like you know, uh, it is what it is, right? You can look me up on IMDb. I'll give you the link right here. It's also in web courses. Uh, if you want to look at my, uh, like I said, if you want to look at my resume, okay, if you want to see all the stuff that I've worked on, um, I'll go over a par a portion of the outline with each keynote let you know the topics that we're going to address in that particular keynote. This happens to be the whole outline for the first two thirds of the class. So um, it would probably only be one page in subsequent keynotes and maybe not even more than two, two sections. Uh, I told you about Cook Optics TV already. Um, I told you about your textbook and where you can go on Amazon to rent it. Don't forget the little widget, you gotta, you gotta punch in I punched in April 23rd that, you know, if you wanted to hold on to it for an extra week, you could punch in April uh, 23rd is Friday. So, you know, seven more days would be the 30th, April 30th. Uh, the price will probably go up again a little bit. Uh, April 23rd, when I put that in the little text box here, it generated a price for me for rental of uh, $21.29. So for what it's worth. Otherwise, you have these other uh, these other books in your production library already. Uh, I assigned some reading out of the assistance manual, out of the cinematography book, uh, and I think the grip book in this particular class. <clears throat> the other stuff, and possibly this white paper from uh, from uh, the author Wells. Uh, she wrote uh, a piece on camera movement, and I think I touch on this in uh, week twelve. So you've got it all here. You don't have to buy anything else. Just got to rent the text and you'll be good to go for the semester. Okay. So um, like I said, uh, well, actually we do meet uh, your section three. We do meet next week. So your reading for this week is the first chapter of the intro to cinematography. It's uh, 17 pages. Uh, so read that. It'll get you started. Uh, it'll acquaint you with the textbook. It's really nice textbook. There's a lot of images in it. And um, 
it's a real comfortable read. It's not, uh, the pages aren't jam packed with stuff, you know, it's chunked up real nice. And there's a lot of charts and images and, and stuff like that. And so, you know, a th this isn't like my advertising uh, text, I can tell you that. Uh, you know, a 30 page read in my advertising text when I was an undergrad used to take me um, about an hour and a half of sticking with it and not taking breaks. An hour and a half of constant reading to get through a chapter. And these chapters are really quick and time flies really fast. Like here, there's two pages right here that are mostly bulleted points, right? So it's not the kind of thing that you read, you close read like you would uh, other kinds of textbooks. It's, it's really sort of chunked up information that's there for quick reference, okay? I think it's a nice text and I, I think you guys will like it too. So uh, your job is to read the first chapter for next week uh, familiarize yourself with that and and do your financial aid assignment by Friday. Okay. By Friday. That's what it says in the calendar. I don't know how they deal with you guys if you're late with that sort of thing. I think you can be late. I, I, I think you can. It's just that they, they say that it might forestall you receiving your, your financial aid benefits uh, on, you know, so if you get it in by the 15th, you're, you're sure to get your financial aid on time is, is what they've told me. So, uh, so do it by, you know, uh, you know, you can put any number in there and you'll get credit for answering the, the question. Okay. So just do that by Friday. Um, and then I'll see you next, uh, what next Tuesday. Right. So that's, I think that's, I think I want to stop here. That's all I've got. So, and in fact, I mean, quite frankly, what is it? It's quarter after seven, right? <clears throat> we meet at six o'clock. So, you know, I don't want to do this for three hours on a Tuesday night, you know, and I know that you guys don't either. So here's the thing, right? I'm going to try to keep these get togethers to like an hour, hour and 15. <clears throat> and then it'll all be on web courses. You can see all, all of the structural <coughs> formations of the class are all here already. I just need to tweak them, make sure all the stuff is there that needs to be there. And I'm just going to start publishing these. Boom, 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 boom. Right. So you can go on web courses anytime you want, and you can pretty much go through this class. You know, you, you can't really get too far ahead because there's some of the stuff doesn't open until specific dates, but you can go through the class and do it and get it all done. Watch the lectures in your own time on recorded video uh, when you get to it. You know, I may not see you again until the end of the semester face to face, unless you want to. So uh, that's how I want to sort of conduct it, see how that goes this semester, see how you like it. And, uh, you know, and, and let's have fun with it. Okay. So if nobody, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, observations, insults? I have one question. Um, how do we send stuff to you? Like anything like we need help with? Go, uh, you know, hit the people tab in web courses. You know how to do this, right? And send me an email. Okay. I I'm answering people pretty quick, I think. You know, uh, I noticed that a lot of instructors uh, say that they need up to 48 hours to respond to an email when they get it. Uh, we don't have that kind of time, folks. So <clears throat> if you go to the people tab, I'm... I'm Walsh. I'm all the way to the bottom. That's easy. Just wing it all the way to the bottom. And I'm where second guy from the bottom and send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, and I know that time is of the essence. So uh, if it's time sensitive, you know, I don't want you to miss an assignment due date or something because I didn't respond, you know, inside of 48 hours. That's, that's crazy. You do that in the film industry and you won't work long. <laughs> you, they want to know like yesterday what the what the answer to the problem is. So <clears throat> having said that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And uh, I'm going to go back to, uh, how do I do that? Where am I? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, I'm going to adjourn then. I'm going to call this uh, meeting concluded. And if you have any questions, if you think of something later, just shoot me an email. My um, 
my personal email is in the syllabus. Okay. It's a, uh, I, I took a few classes here as a graduate student. So I have a UCF at night's email address. It's on the syllabus. Uh, I prefer you only use that in emergencies. Uh, if you go through web courses, it still links to it links to a different email of mine. Uh, and so I know that if you email me through the syllabus, it's a standard question. And if you email me at my night's email, it's probably an emergency. Right. And so I'm going to treat that with priority until you establish that you're only using my night's email because it's convenient and it's not really an emergency. And then I'm not going to give you that kind of consideration anymore. OK, if it's an emergency, get in touch with me in the night's mail because it goes to my cell phone and then I can start working the problem at my end and get you answers as quickly as I can. OK, um, so that's how you reach me. Any other questions? Okay, then have a good uh, what weekend. Gosh, it's only Tuesday, so I'm not going to see you for a week. Uh, I will start publishing things as soon as I get it done. Right now, you're good to go up through next week in terms of web courses. So have fun with it. Uh, get in there, get your textbooks early so that they don't run out. I don't know how many they have at Amazon, so I wouldn't wait. There's 60 more people in my section one class, 65 people that need textbooks. So, you know, don't, don't linger. Um, that's it. I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for coming.